Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Jersey Church at Home. My name is Becca, and I just wanted to hop on really quickly and welcome you all here this morning. We are so glad that you decided to tune in this morning. I know it's an early morning, and it's a hot one out there today, so we're just so glad that you are here with us today. We're excited about our chapel worship service, and we're just going to join over there right now. So let's all join over there together. If that doesn't light your fire, then your wood's wet. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to the services here at Jersey Baptist Church in the chapel. Glad to have you this morning. Uh, let's get started with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, Lord, is we come this morning, Father, uh, thinking about uh, yesterday and what took place. Father, we just pray, God, for our country this morning we pray god that there would be a, a great revival in the land father that there would be uh, a sense of repentance a sense of rededication father and turn our uh, thoughts and our prayers uh, back to you father god we just give you the praise and the glory for being here today we pray god that our worship would be pleasing to you and uh, Father, it'd be glorifying. We just give you all praise, glory, and honor now. We thank you for what you did with Jesus, Lord, on the cross. And we thank you, God, that uh, you love us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let's stand this beautiful morning and praise our Lord Jesus in song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the said the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for Just to trust his cleansing blood, trust in simple faith to plunge me deep the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh for grace. Thank you. 
everyone. How's everyone doing today? Yeah, all right. We're doing it. It's going to be a hot one today, but we're here in the air conditioning, so it's a good life, right? I was like walking in. I'm like, oh man, it's going to be so hot this week. And then I remembered I'm an accountant who sits at a desk all week in air conditioning. So I was like, why did I, why was I upset about this? Anyway, so happy summer. We're so excited about it. And if you are new with us today, we're so glad that you're new and here with us at Jersey. Uh, we love this church. We really do. It's my home church. It's a lot of our home church here. And we hope that it's your home church 
church too. So if you want to know more about Jersey and hear a little bit more about what we're about, things that we offer, ministries that we're involved in, we'd love to chat with you. And the best way to do that if you're here in the room is by visiting the welcome area. It's going to be out of these doors through the renovated lobby or renovating lobby and um, to your left. And then you'll be able to talk to some people at the welcome area by the fireplace. And if you're online, you don't get to see that messy lobby. You can just text that number on your screen and we'll uh, get back to you that way and tell you more about Jersey and how you can be involved. So we're just so glad that you are here. All right, we have a few things coming up. I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, so this is another reminder. Our choir retreat is coming up on August 10th. So for those of you who are already in the choir, you probably know about this. That's going to be running from 8.30 to 2 o'clock on August 10th. And uh, you're going to be learning about some of the music that's coming up for the fall. And you're even going to be looking at your Christmas music already. I know, Christmas in July. That makes me a little sad in a weird way, but also, hey, it's exciting times. So Christmas music we'll be talking about a little bit, but it's not just going to be all work. There's going to be some fun. It's going to be 50s themed. You guys are going to be rocking out to the 50s. So if you would like to come dressed in 50s outfits, you can do that. Don't feel like you have to. I'm personally a low barrier to entry person. Like, don't give me more I have to do. So if you want to dress in 50s, go for it. It if you don't come anyway um, and you can register for that online at jerseychurch.org slash events oh and then the other thing I wanted to mention last week we talked about our proposed ministry action plan or we call it a map for short um, I like to call it a budget because I'm an accountant so it's what I do um, but it's our proposed ministry action plan for the next year our next fiscal year for the church and so we talked about it you can grab one in the back of the church or you can see it online it just kind of breaks down a little bit what we're planning on doing next year and so if you have questions we're gonna have a Q&A session in here at 1145 today so if you want to stick around till 1145 45, ask any questions that you have. We'd be happy to answer them. And the next Sunday in all of the services, our church members will be voting on that ministry action plan. So that's the map. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about it starts tomorrow. VBS, Vacation Bible School. I know a lot of you are volunteering for it or have little signed up for it. So we are so excited. This kicks off tomorrow morning. It's for kids age four through completed fifth grade. So if they're not registered, we have closed the online registration in advance, but you can still bring somebody tomorrow morning. We'll still let you in. So we're really excited about it. And the theme this year is to talk about what the world thinks is the truth versus what God thinks is the truth. So we're gonna help our kiddos learn that. And they're gonna be learning learning about, and I know it, but I only know the King James Version, so I'm going to read this version of it, but it's from Romans 12. They're going to discover that God does not want them to be conformed to this age, but to be transformed by the renewing of their minds so that they can discern what is the good, perfect, and pleasing will of God. So every day will be an adventure at Breaker Rock Beach. That's the theme. Um, so it's going to be a really good time. So we, what we really want to do today and this morning, what I'm going to do before our special music is pray. We're going to pray for them this morning, and we'll go from there. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the kids that are going to be attending VBS this week, God, and I thank you for the many, many volunteers who are going to make this possible. God, really be with our kids this week. Help them to learn your truth, God, and not the world's truth. God, our kids need you. We need you. Our country needs you. God, just please really be with everyone this week, throughout the week. Help lives to be changed. In your name I pray. Amen. me by I can see it in their eyes empty people filled with care headed who knows where on they go through private pain living fear to Oh 
Morning, everybody. How we doing today? Well, um, a little bit of an audible this morning with everything that happened in Pennsylvania yesterday. Um, we're going to just have a moment of prayer. Um, people need the Lord. And this is not the worst thing our country has ever gone through, but it is definitely not one of the shining moments of um, the political race. And as I was thinking about it last night and this morning, how, how timely our series is. We're talking about what? Hope. And our hope is not in a government. Our hope is not in a political figure. Our hope is in the Lord. And the Lord watches over us, and noth nothing that has happened is outside of His control. Psalm uh, 103 talks about how His throne is established over all. So no humanly throne, no human throne, no human political office is established over God, but yet He is established over them all. And we are in need of His grace now and always. And so as we kind of go through now what will probably be a pretty tumultuous week uh, with the news and with uh, the investigation that will probably happen following up um, the, uh, uh, the event of the, the attempted assassination of, of uh, former President Trump. Uh, I want us all to remain calm and remember that God's in control, we have hope in Him, and we are all in need of His grace. So let me pray. Let me pray for us. Father, you have placed every single one of us in this country, in this time. And Lord, we, we mourn and we grieve for the violence that we saw yesterday. We thank you that former President Trump uh, is okay this morning and that there was not more harm done. But Lord, we do pray for the, the families who lost a loved one. We pray for the other families whose loved one is in critical condition and for those who um, were injured as well. Lord, we pray for their, their hearts. We pray for their physical bodies. We pray for their grieving. Lord, that you would gather people around them that would speak your truth to them, that would give them your comfort. Lord, I thank you that uh, President Biden responded so quickly with denouncing the violence. And that, Lord, we, we don't celebrate violence, but what we've seen in the book of Genesis is that violence comes from our sin. And so, Lord, as the political time continues, Lord, I pray for peace and for safety for the political figures involved, for President Biden, for former President Trump, Lord, that you would keep them both safe and that, Lord, at the, at, after November, that you, your will would be done. And your kingdom would be that much closer to coming, Lord, if you haven't come before then. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 With that being said, let's, let's jump into the book of Genesis. I am now more convinced than ever that what we need to speak is truth. And God's word is truth. And so we're going to speak that this morning from Genesis chapter 6. And I think it's timely in that as... Uh, we have seen from God's good creation go into a fallen, fallen creation because Adam and Eve sinned and then go even further where violence enters the world in Genesis chapter 4 where Cain kills Abel and then violence is perpetuated through his line. We see that that's the, the, the violence comes from sin and we see that then that moves to death. And in Genesis chapter 5, all people die now. You know, and so we are seeing the effects of sin. And then last week we talked about how God looked down and he saw how wicked that the world had become and he had regretted that he had made it. He was grieved by it. And so as, as we think about the events that are happening, not just in our country, but around the world, we think about the war in Israel, we think about the war in Ukraine, we think about the continual war on terror, uh, human trafficking, civil wars in Africa that are often overlooked. You think about the violence that has spread and how if God regretted it when Noah walked this earth, he regrets it and he grieves over it now. And so God in this time, in Genesis 6, shows his power that he is preparing to judge the world. 
And we're going to look at what he, ju- what he begins to do in that story of judging the world as he talks with Noah. Because remember, in the midst of God's judgment, there is always hope because there is God's grace. And at the midst of ju- God, in the midst of God's judgment, in uh, chapter 6, verse 8, he says, Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. Noah found grace with the Lord. And we can say that about many of our lives right now. Though Matt Reed's life was full of sin and deserved judgment, I found grace with God through Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's the story that we are in, and we are taking another step in that as we move into verses, chapter 6, verses 9 through 22. I'm not going to read all of it. It's a little bit long, and, and we're actually going to start in verse 11. So let's go ahead and skip down to verse 11. What I'm going to do is I'm going to follow four words. Two are adverbs of time, meaning they're describing a time that the timeline is going on. And two are conjunctions, meaning they're comparing or connecting two ideas that are in the passage. So the first word is the word now, an adverb of time. Verse 11 says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth was, for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. I'm going to pause there. There's one word that goes over and over and over and over again. It's the word corrupt. It's said three different times. And and that word means to ruin. When it says something's corrupted, it's ruined. You think about a battery that's corroded, it's ruined. It's good for nothing. What the, the word here is that something is corrupt, it's ruined. It's like moth, moths have come and they've eaten through a garment. And you go to put that garment on, well, it's no good anymore. Why? Because there's holes in everything. You can't wear it out. It, can't, it doesn't block the wind if it's a jacket. It doesn't keep the sun off your back if it's a shirt. It, it is ruined. And so he looks down and he says that the earth was ruined. And notice that. Earth is used four times. What is ruined? The earth is ruined. Now the earth was corrupt. The earth was ruined in God's sight. And the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how, the, how corrupted the earth was for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. What was ruined? The earth was ruined. And so that's where we come in our story right now. We, you know, and, and when this word now, it says now, in the present, as God was getting ready to speak to Noah, he said now the earth is ruined. That is something that has happened. My, um, when I was growing up, does anybody remember G.I. Joes? <laughs> All right. Now, there's been a few variations of them. My dad always joked that his first G.I. Joe was like this big, right? There are a couple people nodding their heads. They were big. I played with the ones that are about this big. And those came with three different pieces. Now, they came put together, right? But there was the upper torso, there were the hips, and there were the legs. And if you played with them enough, like I did, they broke. And what would happen is there was a rubber band that would go from the to- inside the torso down to the legs on a hook and it would hold it together. Well, one day I broke one of them and I took it to my dad and I gave it to him. I was like, Dad, what do I do with this? And he said, well, I'll look at it. The next morning I got up and I was so excited. He had fixed it. I, I could not believe it. I, I didn't think it was possible. But what happened is he had reached in there and gotten the rubber band uh, that was still in the torso and put it back on the legs and he put it all together. Well, needless to say, uh, it wasn't long later I brought that same G.I. Joe back. And I said, Dad, can you fix this? And he goes, I'll look at it. And next morning it was not fixed. I was highly disappointed. And I said, what happened? He goes, well, the rubber band broke. So it's unfixable. It's ruined. You know, and, and now I, 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 what I did then was I got ingenious and I tried to put my own rubber band around there, but it just never was the same, right? The, the, the toy was ruined. And as God looked down on the earth, it was ruined. I could no longer play with my toy anymore. The guy was just a casualty on the battlefield, <laughs> Right? Like, I could no longer play with the toy. It wasn't good to be played with anymore. The earth was not good like it had been created. The earth was broken and it was ruined. And that's where God looks down and that's where he's at right in that moment. Now. And then in verse 13, the next word is then. So now that was happening. Then God said. As God looked down, he saw that the world was corrupted. In verse 13, it says, Then God said to Noah. So Noah's conversation with the Lord is based upon the, the world being ruined. 
Then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Again, he uses the earth two times. What is God going to destroy? The earth. Now, what's fascinating is this word for destroy is the same Hebrew word as for corrupt. So basically, God looks down and he says, I'm going to corrupt, I'm going to ruin all living creatures. Why? Because they ruined my creation. The crime fits the punishment. That as God looked down and said, if you, because of your sin, are going to ruin what I've created good, then I will ruin you. And so that's where he's telling this to Noah. As this has happened, as wickedness has filled the earth, he says, I'm going to take care of it and I'm going to ruin it. And so we have this timeline now. Now God is looking at the, the world. Then he makes a decision on what he's going to deal with it. And, and he tells Noah, make yourself an ark of gopher wood in verse 14. And he gives the dimensions here. What's interesting about the dimensions is they're, they're bigger than it, but they correspond to the tabernacle out of the book of Exodus. If you don't know what the tabernacle is, after God leads Israel out of slavery in Egypt and he's leading them through the wilderness, he brings them a place of worship, doesn't bring them, he describes them a place of worship and gives them very specific instructions on how to build it. He says, you'll build it, it's a tent. You'll build it this way. You'll use these kind of materials. These people will do this. These people will do that. And, and he's very specific because it was a place of worship. The tabernacle in the book of Exodus was where everybody went to hear from the Lord. It's where they went to get guidance from the Lord. It was a sanctuary for them. And what God is telling Noah is he's like, look, the world is ruined and I'm now going to ruin it. I'm going to destroy it. You build for yourself a sanctuary that will save you. That will save you and your family. And so he gives the dimensions of the ark all the way down to the roof being 18 inches from the side walls. In verse 17, then he says, understand, this is the first. So he asks him to build the ark. And then in verse 17, he tells him why. He says, understand that I am bringing a flood, flood waters on the earth to destroy. It's the same word again, to destroy every creature under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. So again, you see this repetition of the word corrupt or being ruined and what's going to be ruined? The earth. The earth was ruined by humanity, by humanity's sin. Now God is going to ruin humanity and the earth and it's, you just hear it over and over and in the end, every living thing will die. Everything on earth will perish. So we have the, this is what the now is and then God's going to do this. But then we come to our first conjunction in verse 18, after God says everything will die, but God's talking with Noah. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark with your sons, your wife, and your, your son's wives. You also are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. So notice, after God says, everybody's going to die, he says, but you know are going to live. You and your family and two of every kind of animal are going to live. So in the sanctuary of the ark, there's life. And over the sanctuary of the ark, there's the covenant. It says, everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant. Now, we talk a lot about covenants in, uh, in, in Christianity. Why? Because we have this old covenant with Moses and with the Old Testament where sacrifices are needed to make atonement for sins. And then we have the new covenant in Jesus Christ, right? And now we, we have, and there's actually a lot more, and I'm not going into them, but there's other covenants you th see throughout the scriptures, this being one of them, that when the flood comes, God is not after the flood making up a plan of, oh, now what do I do? I guess I saved Mo Noah. Now what am I going to do? No. God, before Noah gets on the ark, says, look, this is what's going to happen, and this is my plan. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a covenant with you and your family. And what that covenant is, it's, it's a plan for salvation. When somebody made a covenant with another person, what it was, at its basic level, it guided the behaviors of 
and the interactions between the two different people or groups. And so God's saying, look, I'm going to make a covenant and it's going to guide my interactions with you. And God's pointing out then, my first interaction with you is to save you from the flood. And he says, I will establish then a relationship between us. In essence, like he told Israel, you will be my people and I will be your God. That's what he's saying to Noah. And there's going to be an understanding between the two of us. So in the midst of God's judgment, this is where the hope lies. In the covenant that he will make with Noah. Because God saves his people. As God had grace on Noah, God saves his people. And so this, this word for covenant is very important. And this is the first time in the Bible that it's used. And so if you ever wonder what covenant's about, the first time it's used, it's about salvation. Which then impacts every other usage in the scriptures afterwards. And so God sees in the now, the world is, is corrupt. Then he makes a plan to destroy it, because, but he talks to Noah about it. But now we're seeing that in the midst of that judgment, he is going to save Noah. And if you ever have inner, any wonderings about who he's talking about saving, the, the second, uh, I got to think about this, sorry, a lot of grammar in this sermon. But if you look at all the uses of the word you or your, it's 11 times. It's 11 times from verse 18 to verse 21. And it's talking, and he, again, he's talking to Noah. So 11 times he looks at Noah and he says, you, you, I'm going to save you. You are going to, I'm going to use you to save the animals. I'm going to use you to save your family. You, you, you. I mean, over and over and over again. So if you ever wonder who this covenant's with, the scriptures are making it clear that it's with Noah. And he's saying, look, Noah, I am going to save you. And everybody with Noah will not perish, but will live. And then we come to verse 22 at the very end here. So we've had now, we've had then, we've had but, and now we have and. After all of this conversation, what and does is it connects two thought lines, two ideas. And so after God has laid out his plan to Noah, it says, and Noah did this. He did everything that God had commanded him. Noah obeyed. Think about that. God lays out this whole plan, and he says, look, look, the world's corrupted. Build an ark. I'm going to destroy the world with a flood, but I'm going to make sure everybody with you lives. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'll be your God, and you'll be my people. And so what does Noah do? How does Noah respond? He does everything that God asks him to do. Obedience means that you comply to what's been told to you or comply with what's been commanded to you. Noah obeyed and did everything, not just some of it, not just parts of it, but all of it. It reminds me of King Saul where he was told, uh, where he was told in the book of 1 Samuel to kill all the animals and all the people of the people had invaded that were trying to corrupt the people of Israel. He was said to destroy it all. And what, what happened when the prophet Samuel showed up? He said, what's the bleeding of sheep that I hear? And Saul tried to walk his way out of it. Well, I'm going to use those for sacrifices. And, and Samuel's like, do you think God cares more about sacrifices or obedience? And so here Noah did not fall short, but did everything that God asked him to do. Did everything that God commanded him to do. Noah was obedient but here's the thing. And, and you think, well, Matt, if, if God came to me and said, I'm going to destroy the earth with a flood, I'd obey too. You know what? I'd, I'd like to think that, but here's the thing. If we go back to that tough passage at the beginning of chapter 6, where the sons of God came down and they were doing sinful things with the daughters of men, when we talk about that, what does God say? It says that, he said, my spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120. Like he looks down and it's clearly saying, you're doing wrong here. You've got to stop this. God said, I will not be part of this. This will be separated from me. But what do the sons of God do? They do not change their actions at all. Isn't that fascinating? They continue in the line of walking. But Noah, who finds grace in God, when God says, look, this is what's happening, so this is what you need to do, Noah goes, yes, sir, and then he does everything. The difference between God's people and the world is right there. That when God warns the world, they don't respond. But when God warns his people, they respond. 
And so as we sit here today and we think about, are we God's people? The question is, do you respond when he commands you to do something? And I'll, 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 let's, let's give Noah a little bit more credit because it wasn't like God just showed up out of nowhere and said, you need to do this. And Noah had no idea what was happening and said, okay, no, obedience in Noah's life was built. And how do we know that? Let's go back to verse 9. Go back to verse 9. It says, these are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his, uh, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God. To be a righteous man meant that you followed God's moral law. We would describe it as a good man, a good person, right? In general, we'd say that person's a good person. Well, Mo Noah, in general, followed God's moral law. But when you moved on to blameless, blameless then was, uh, the root word is whole or complete. And so there's this idea of you being holy and completely God's. It's, it's used for unblemished sacrifices. So those sacrifices that were given to God were to be pure. And so this idea of blameless is purity and, and holiness. Um, uh, in Psalms 119, Psalm 119, 119 verse 1, it says, How happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the instruction of the Lord. So the idea here is, is the person whose way is blameless is that person who's following the instruction of the Lord. But there's, there's more than just being a righteous person, being a good person. It's, it's you're doing it well. You're doing it holy. And then you come to the final description of Noah, and it's Noah walked with God. And we talked about that in chapter 5 with Enoch, right? Noah walked with God, or Enoch walked with God and then was no more. What's that mean? Well, when you walk with somebody, you're next to them. You're making them a priority. And, and we only see Noah and Enoch described in this specific way. Others walked before God. Others followed God. But only Enoch and Noah walked with God. And so what you see in this description of Noah's life is that he was righteous. Well, a lot of people were righteous. He was blameless. Not a lot of people were blameless. And he walked with God, and only one other person in the Bible did that. Old Testament did that. So you see this, this stair-stepping of understanding Noah's character. That's who Noah was before God talked to him. So Noah's obedience was built in the fire of his character being built throughout his time. So that finally when God came to him, Noah was ready to be obedient in the big thing. He was obedient in all of the daily things so that when God finally came to him with something big, he was ready. Because obedience, an attitude, a spirit of obedience is built over time. But we as God's people... We need to be obedient. God has promised to save us. And we need to be obedient. That's our response. As we have a covenant with God, which is a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's de declaration. When I, God, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. God is made, making a new covenant, and we are part of that. That new covenant comes in Jesus Christ. That Christ, what, is, what do we say when we do communion? Jesus sat at the table and he said, this wine is my blood of the new covenant. The old is gone and behold, the new has come. In Christ we find the new covenant. And the covenant is our promise of salvation. Our promise of receiving grace. Why and how? Through the blood and through the crucifixion and the resurrection and the new life of Jesus Christ. That's where we find our covenant with God. If you believe and place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are part of the people of God, which means you receive the promise of God's salvation, just like Noah did. And so what should our response be to that? Obedience. Daily and regular obedience. I loved what one pastor said about, uh, about Noah. He called him the solitary saint. Because Noah was a righteous man in the midst of an unrighteous world. And so when we start talking about obedience, what's that mean for us today? We, at times, have to be solitary saints. You know exactly what I'm talking about. When you're at work and you're the only one that wants to do what's right. 
When you're sitting with your family and you're trying to make a decision and you're the only one who wants to do what's right. When you're sitting with friends and friends are, are talking about things and they're wanting you to participate in those conversations, but you as the one believer, the solitary saint, as you stand there, you know that you can't do it. That's how Noah lived his life. The solitary saint in the midst of a corrupt and broken world. So as we talk about obedience, we have to go there. Daily and regular obedience, no matter if you're a solitary saint or we're sitting in here together this morning. Obedience. Daily and regular obedience, doing fully and completely what God has asked. We've not been given a tabernacle, but we've been given a covenant with, through Christ. And often we are solitary saints, but I love another phrase that somebody told me once You plus God is the majority. You plus God is the majority. Think about that. No matter what happens on this earth, if God is on your side, what can man do to you? Was that Psalm 56? What can mere mortals do to me? They trample me all day long. They fight against me. I just drew a blank on the next line. But they trample against me, or they fight against me, and they oppress me. Oh, they oppress me. They fight against me, and they press me all day long. It says, but Lord, you are the king. What can mere mortals do to me? And that's what we have to remember. What can mere mortals do to us? So in those times when we're solitary saints like Moses, we have to practice obedience. And those, are, those times of obedience have to be built on daily and regular obedience. And so what, we, what I encourage you to do this week, acts of random kindness. I did not make that up. I stole it from somebody, but the initials are ARC, in case you're wondering. Acts of random kindness. You look at ways where you can care for people. You look for ways where you can obey God and, and serve people. And when you do that, and you don't shy away from those, those are actually acts of obedience to God. Because we've been called to love people as Christ has loved us. And so we have been given Christ. That's the covenant we have. God has promised us salvation through him. And so we need to respond like Moses and obey. And we need to do it daily and we need to do it regularly. Acts of random kindness. Acts of random kindness. I love, because um, you're gonna find in, li you're gonna find in life, you're, you're gonna feel lost, you're gonna feel confused, you're gonna feel alone, you're gonna feel, um, you're not sure what to do next. And in those times, you seek to obey the Lord and he will take care of you. I love the story of um, C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia, um, the horse and his boy. And it's about this boy who meets a horse that can talk to him and they, they're trying to escape slavery. Well, they escape out of a town. They get separated from their friends and, and he even, and Shasta, the main character, gets separated from the horse and he finds himself in a cemetery a cemetery of tombs that are haunted and, um, and scary. And he's sitting there and the sun goes down and it gets dark. And then all of a sudden he begins to hear the jackals crying. And that, that eerie laugh that we all know from the movie Lion King, right? You know, this, the, the jackals are laughing. And he said, and all of a sudden, this cat shows up and sits next to him. And the shadow of the cat scares the jackals away and, come, and the, the fur, the warmth of the cat comforts the character Shasta. Well, in the end, what he realizes is that cat was actually the mighty Aslan, who's the God figure, figure of the story and who's a mighty lion. See, God showed up in Shasta's time of fear. When you are that solitary saint, God will always show up. God will always show up. No matter if the jackals are crying, no matter if wickedness is coming in upon you, but you've got to stand as the solitary saint, which means you have to start obeying daily and regularly. And I'm not asking for perfection. 
I will never ask for perfection because I can't give it and you can't give it. But sometimes the most obedient thing we can do is repent of a sin. We fall into temptation. The next best thing is to repent of the sin and move forward. But seek to obey God to the best of your ability because you're not alone. He's promised to save you and he will bring you something to do that is great. But start today with daily acts of obedience. Let's pray. Lord, as we think about everything that's happening in the world around us, what this world needs now is you. What this world needs now is for you to intervene. And though we recognize that in the past you have intervened in miracles, we recognize that in, in ways of power that only the Almighty God can do, but often, God, and most often, you intervene through your people. You intervene by using your people to further your name and your kingdom. And so, God, as we sit here today, claiming to be and, and honestly are your people, your church, we ask that you would help us obey that you would help us to obey on a daily and regular basis, Holy Spirit, that we may be your tools to further your kingdom in this earth. For Lord, we recognize that it is full of wickedness and sin and violence. But Lord, your way is the way of peace and of love and of salvation. Let us obey your way. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us here at Jersey this morning. We love worshiping with you every week, and we are so glad that you joined us today. If anything that Pastor Matt said this morning really spoke to you, or if you made any decisions this morning, we would love to hear about that. You can always text us any time of day or night to 740-457-1525. Throughout the week, you can call us at 740-927-1859, or you can always always email us and that email address is email at jerseychurch.org. So, so many ways to get a hold of us, so many ways to connect with you. We are just so excited that you're here and we're already looking forward to worshiping with you again next week. Have a great week.